So today we're going to be discussing in a little bit more detail about sound waves and resonance in uh, different types of tubes, open-ended and closed-ended tubes. As a quick reminder, uh, we want to remind you that when we talk about sound, technically sound is a longitudinal wave, and you see a couple different longitudinal waves here. So we will be presenting sound as a transverse wave. Uh, it's a little bit easier to visualize when we're talking about the standing waves, but we want to make sure that you do see that sound is actually a longitudinal wave. So as we see here in the one-dimensional, what you have is there's a sound being created, which is a vibration. That vibration uh, energy travels through the air in this example, but it doesn't actually move the air molecules from one into the other. It just ma makes the air molecules vibrate. And so you've got the displacement of the air going left to right, and then the velocity of the energy wave in a longitudinal wave is going to be parallel to that. And then here we've got a more two-dimensional representation, and what you have is the sound being sent out in a circular pattern is what would actually happen. You can, when someone speaks, you can hear them in front of you, behind you, to the side. And the displacement um, is in different directions depending on where you are around in the circle that's hearing, but the velocity will always be parallel to that displacement. So if we're going to convert a longitudinal wave into a transverse wave, this is one way to think about it. Uh, in this particular example, you can think about um, where the compressions are, you could think about those as peaks, and you can think about the refractions where things are more spread apart, there's lower density, and those can be considered troughs. Uh, you can also think about where if you've got a standing wave where you've got parts where the air is moving a lot and the air is not moving at all, you can think about those as peaks and waves. So if we take a look at an example of a standing wave, we've shown you with the springs a standing wave uh, as it is as a transverse wave, but you haven't quite seen what a longitudinal standing wave looks like. So we're going to take a look so at that I video. Have it, and as I get to 35 hertz, one thing that you begin to notice is we begin to generate a standing wave right around, there we go, 33.32.5 hertz is where we get it. And so if I look at this little situation, I'll zoom in on it a little bit so you can see. What you're going to notice is that there are points within this uh, a spring which have nodes and other points which have anti-nodes. And so I can take this little node card, as I call it, and I can stick it in the spring right here. And we are absolutely nothing at all. But meanwhile, I can go down here and stick that little node card and we hear a lot of chatter from the coils of that spring vibrating with the note card. We call this an antinote, and we call this an antinote, and then right in between those two antinodes is this spot right here, which we would call note. So now that you've seen what a standing wave looks like as a longitudinal wave, we need to talk a little bit more about it and how we're going to read that as a transverse wave just to make it a little bit easier to see when we're doing problems. And so what we have here is a representation that shows a actual standing wave is a longitudinal wave so these little balls represent particles of air over on this side this would represent a vibration coming in it could be a speaker it could be someone's voice but it's at a certain frequency that creates a standing wave and so we have a couple different points this little point right here this little red dot you notice it's not moving and this little red dot happens to be moving a lot and so if we take a look down here we see the exact same wave represented as a transverse wave where right here at the node that's the point of no movement and so you don't see the transverse wave moving at that spot but over here the air molecules that are moving quite a bit there's a lot of movement there we can represent that as an anti-node where you have a lot of movement so again you have waves coming in and waves reflecting back but at certain frequencies they do set up these standing waves um, now, it is important, this is a critical point to understand for this slide, and that is, over here we have a closed end. In other words, this is an open tube on one end, but on this end it's capped off, and so you've got a negative reflection coming off, just like you do with any wave coming off a fixed point. And when that happens, you get a node, a point that is not moving. Closed ends, this is what we need you to remember, closed ends are going to have a node. Over here, however, we have an open end. It's not reflecting off a solid surface. And so when you have an open end, the opposite happens. Instead of having a node, you have an anti-node.
We're about ready to use this, so make sure that you do remember closed ends, nodes where the air is sitting still, open end, anti nodes where the air is rushing in and out as it moves. So there's a great example of this that I would be loving to show you at school. It is actually a pretty cool example, and I'm grateful that we have one set up over there. But unfortunately, since we're out, uh, we're going to just have to rely on some internet video to show you the same thing. Still pretty impressive. Uh, so we have a certain type of tube that we've set up where you do have a speaker uh, at one end, and that's going to be setting up different standing waves depending on the frequencies being played. And as we just discussed... Uh, there's going to be certain points where the air is going to be sitting still, the nodes, and certain points where the air is going to be moving a lot. Now, what makes this a little bit special is this, is that the tube that we have set up has holes in it. When we've put through some natural gas, and so it will be on fire. So if you go back and you think about this, you, you notice that you've got high points and low points. Well, which point is which? If you think about when you move a lot of oxygen through, uh, you get a larger flame. So here at the nodes where the air is sitting still, that's pretty calm. So at the nodes, you're going to have the low points where there's not a lot of oxygen coming through. But where you have the anti-nodes where there's a lot of air rushing in and out, in and out, that's where the flames are going to get tall. And so uh, the device is called a Rubens tube. And we actually have two videos to show you. The first one is a straight line tube. And then another one is more of a two-dimensional Rubens uh, tube I don't know if you call it Rubens table but either way it was just kind of a neat way to see this two-dimensional effect let's throw some sound in there see what happens let's start with a 449 Hertz frequency as you can see this sets up a standing wave and we can see well the emerging sine curve that represents sound what happens here is we're having the sound compression here and not compressing here the lower pressure here allows more gas to escape into the atmosphere, shaping the sound curve. Now, if we change the frequency, we can see each time we set up a standing wave, we get that sine curve. Higher the frequency, the more waves. Now, let's throw some music at this. How about some Dave Rubeck? Now we have real life sound visualization with five. The Dave Rubeck isn't uh, terribly energetic, so let's try something uh, a little more energetic. that's going to be open at both ends and one that's going to be open at one end and closed at the other. And so what we have right in here is the simplest wave, the fundamental frequency in which you can set up a standing wave where on the open ends it has to have an antinode at both ends. So this is the smallest possible wave that you can have where that occurs. And then here we have a closed end so you have to have a node and an open end where you have to have an anti-node. Now if you want to visualize that a little bit better uh, we can take a look at the animations like this where you've got the anti-nodes on one end and on the other and a node in the middle and then here for the closed pipe you have the node at one end where there is no motion everything is always destructive interference and canceling out and on the other end where we have constructive interference where sometimes you get a large peak and sometimes you get a large trough. So again these are the lowest frequencies that you could possibly have. Everything that we're going to take a look after this is going to be either this frequency or a multiple of it. So let's go ahead and take a look at uh, how much of a wave is that actually. So what we have right here is a full complete wavelength and remember every 
anti-node from midpoint to midpoint would be considered a half a wavelength. So we have an entire whole wavelength here. Now, for the first example we're taking a look at, we had just from a crest to a trough, uh, from a crest to a trough is only going to be half of a wavelength. You have to go from a crest to another crest in order to get to the whole wavelength. So when you have this section right here, from a crest to a trough, you have half a wavelength. And if we take a look at the wave setup that we had before, the lowest frequency that can set up a standing wave in an open-ended tube, what you have is exactly half of a wavelength. So this ends up being a quarter of a wavelength. This is a quarter of a wavelength. Get up to the whole half here. Uh, so in an open-ended tube, the smallest possible standing wave is twice the length of the tube. In other words, the length of the tube is half the wavelength. Now that we know what a fundamental wave looks like in an open-ended tube, we need to move on to what do the harmonics look like. Keep it in mind that a uh, wave is a half wavelength if it goes from a crest to a trough. If you follow a little bit of logic that the next harmonic would have to have another open end, here we have a crest to a trough, so that's a half a wave, and here we have a trough to a crest, that's another half wave, so that's two halves that adds up to be a whole wave. And the next one would be crest to trough, trough to crest, crest to trough, that's three halves of waves. And so the pattern that you see is it goes from one half, two halves, three halves, four halves, and five halves. That actually gives us a little bit of a pattern here. Uh, we also want to point out that the frequencies here, if this is the first harmonic, then the second harmonic would have twice that frequency. The third harmonic would have three times that frequency. It's just the same way that the standing waves and strings are. Or if you have the fifth harmonic as an example, then that's going to be five times the frequency of the uh, fundamental frequency. So the formulas we get here, if we take a look at the fact that the, uh, the halves go up, one half, two halves, three halves, four halves, five halves, then if you have the fourth harmonic, you have four halves. If fifth harmonic, you have five halves. So n being the harmonic number, you can just say the length of the tube is a harmonic number times a wavelength divided by two. In other words, its third harmonic would be three halves of a wavelength. If you rearrange that to solve for the wavelength, you'd say the wavelength is twice the length of the tube divided by the number of harmonics. And then again, don't forget that the frequency of whichever harmonic you're on is going to be the harmonic number times the fundamental frequency, whatever that may be. Going back to our original wave, again, one complete wavelength, if we divide this in half again, uh, we could go from mid midpoint to midpoint, that's half of a wave, but we're going to be talking about closed-ended pipes, and if you remember with a closed-ended pipe, it had to have a, a node, and then it had to have an anti-node, and so if we actually take this and we divide it in half, that is the lowest possible frequency wavelength that we can have for a closed-ended pipe with a node at one end and an antinode at the other. But you notice that this is not even half of a wavelength. This is actually half of a half. And so from here to here, that actually ends up being a quarter of a wavelength is the length of the pipe. So to sum up, if you have a closed-ended pipe, the lowest possible frequency wave would actually be one-fourth the wavelength would be how long that pipe is for the fundamental frequency. So that means that the wave is actually four times longer than the tube that contains the lowest standing wave. If you want to see a complete wave, we can go ahead and draw a picture of that. So this is the lowest frequency that can form there, and you can see how that is only about one-fourth of a full complete wave. Taking a look at the harmonics in a closed-end pipes, this would be the first harmonic. Now the next next harmonic would also have to have an open end, so that would have to be over here, where we've got an open end antinode and a closed end has the node, um, and then each time we go down, and so what we see is we see a whole loop that's a half of a wave, but then here that's that quarter loop again. So what we end up with is a fourth of a wave three-fourths of the wave, five-fourths of the wave, seven-fourths of the wave, where are the even numbers? Where's the two-fourths and the four-fourths? Well, if we were to draw those, they would look like this. The second harmonic would look like this, where you've got 
a node and a node, but remember, at an open end, you cannot have a node. It has to be open. At the fourth harmonic, you can't have another node here. So actually, when we take a look at these harmonics, it turns out that you can only have odd numbered harmonics when you have a closed end tube since one end is closed the other end is open you always have to have an antinode here and that excludes the even number harmonics which would give you nodes so those do not exist you do not have even numbered harmonics in a closed ended tube so the frequency the first harmonic you can go ahead and calculate what that frequency would be if you know the speed of the wave and the length of the tube. But then the third harmonic would be three times the frequency. And again, the pattern follows through as we saw before. Just remember that you can only plug in odd number harmonics. So these are your formulas. Uh, in, with the open-ended tubes, it was half waves. But with closed-ended tubes, it is quarter waves. So we have a four on bottom. So they look very similar except for the 2 becomes a 4. Uh, this is the exact same formula for the frequency as we had with the open-ended tubes. The main thing to remember here is that you can only have odd numbers when you're plugging in the harmonics for closed-ended tubes that are open on the other end. Now I want to stop for a second here and just remind you that as you go through this, you should be writing these things down and you do want to be taking notes. At the very, very minimum, you want to get some drawings down of what the different harmonics look like. You want to have the formulas written down. We will be using these for class next time. You don't want to watch the entire video to get this. Take some decent notes so you can look up the basics and make sure that we're able to use those. For the rest of what we want to talk about, there's not going to be any more math involved. We just want to talk about some of the applications of what we're just what we've been discussing and to be perfectly honest the best applications of these ideas are going to be in music so here we've got uh, two similar type situations here where we rush air through pipes so you've got pipe organs like you might find at your church or this is called a pan flute uh, in either case if you've ever been at church and you've wondered why you have so many different sized pipes it's Hopefully you realize now because the different sized pipes are going to hold different wavelengths which are going to have different frequencies. And I hope you recall that the longer pipes are going to have the larger wavelengths and that corresponds to a low frequency, the lower notes, the lower pitches. And the short pipes are going to have the smaller wavelengths which correspond to the higher frequencies. And this pipe operates in the exact same way. Uh, as you blow air over the pipes you set up these standing waves and so these are the high frequency pipes, these are the low frequency pipes. We got a short little video just to show you what that looks like. Another example of using these ideas is a bugle. Now, what's interesting about the bugle is the fact that it has no moving parts, but yet you can play different notes. And in the video that you're about ready to see, what you want to remember is that you don't just play the fundamental frequency. Uh, if you have higher frequencies, you can set up standing waves of those extra harmonics. And the way that it's done with instruments, brass instruments in particular, like the bugle, is by vibrating your lips at different frequencies. Now, I'm not going to act like I have ever played a brass instrument. When I was in school, I played the cello. So we were talking about string instruments there. Um, but as you vibrate your lips on the mouthpiece at different rates, uh, you can set up the fundamental frequency. If you double that vibration, you can set up the second harmonic, the third harmonic. And so in the video, what you're going to see is all the man is doing is holding the bugle, but as he vibrates his lips at different frequencies, he's able to play many different notes with no moving parts in this instrument. <laughs> Another 
instrument I wanted to talk about is trombones. And so with trombones, they're different than bugles uh, because trombones do have moving parts. Uh, so you've got the slider, and the slider can go uh, forward and backwards, and that changes the length of the air column, the tube that the sound waves travel through. So here, you've got the slider uh, at its very shortest position, and that would correspond, short wavelengths, remember, are going to have high frequencies. But as you extend the slider out, now you travel through a longer wavelength, that gives you a longer air column, you can fit larger waves, which would correspond to lower frequencies as you slide the slider out. Um, so we have two different videos for you to take a look at. We've got the first video where you can see the effects of the slider being used. But we also wanted to point out you do not always have to use the slider to play different notes. You can actually play the trombone like a bugle. So the second video shows how the slider is being held still, but yet he's able to play many different notes by causing the different harmonics to form, not just the fundamental frequency, but the higher frequencies, the second, third, fourth harmonics, and those will still correspond to higher notes, which are multiples of the fundamental frequency. And then the final instrument we want to discuss is the trumpet. Now, if you're like me, you saw people playing a trumpet, you say, hey, you push on some buttons, you blow air, make some noise, didn't really think too much about it until we were studying sound. Uh, but now that we do that, uh, what we want to take a quick look at is, what does pushing these buttons do? If you take a close look here, what you see is, you see this tube coming out, you see this tube coming out, and you see this tube coming out. And what this basically leads to is this idea. As you blow the air through here, the air could travel through here, and then it could travel straight through here and out. But when you press these valves, these buttons down, what you actually do, if you take a look at the inside, they have openings. And so, if we take a look at the first situation here, when you do not have anything depressed, the air goes straight through. And so, it goes just through the basic air column from here to there. But when you push the valve down, there's another opening, and that leads it through one of those extra tubing lengths that increases the length of the air column that the air travels through, which lowers the frequency of the note being played. So again, as you press these down, you press this down, it allows the air to travel through this tube. If you press the middle down, it allows the air to travel this through this extra length of the tube. And if you were to take a look at the length of the air column, what you would see is it's actually a fraction of the wavelength for the fundamental frequency that's being played at that point. So a little bit more to the trumpets than I originally thought when I was in middle school playing my musical instruments. <laughs> That is the end of today's notes. Now next class, I did not include this today because I thought that this video was long enough. So next class, we're going to go through some specific examples using these equations. And just as a quick summary, uh, some of the ones that you should have written down at this point. Remember, we've got our original speed, wave speed equation. Speed of the wave is the frequency times the wavelength. And then we have our relationships between the length of the tube and the wavelength that's formed. This would be for a closed-ended pipe. This divided by two would be for an open-ended pipe. And finally, don't forget about how the harmonic frequency is the number of the harmonic multiplied by the fundamental frequency. So we will see you next time. Please make sure that you've got these notes written down and that you're ready to ask questions. If you need, we'll set up a Zoom session. Folks, have a good day.